intend to handle big horses or little ponies, we must be aware at all times that they are all stronger than we are. When free to move in the stable or when out in the field, they can be unpredictable. Their size and strength, even in the case of small ponies, is such that if not treated firmly and with respect, can cause much damage and worse still, injury to themselves and to their handlers. In this programme, we'll be looking at how, if we are to work safely with our horses, we must win their trust and cooperation. To do this, we must act firmly, kindly, and above all, consistently. For it is only then that the horse will learn that we mean him no harm. We can then begin to train him to do what we want, using tact, a firm hand and kind words. We'll look at how to approach the horse and how to best fit the head collar. This can be fairly straightforward in the stable, but the horse at grass who doesn't want to be caught can make our life very tiresome. We'll see how to lead the horse correctly and how to tie him up safely, as well as how to handle him while he is tied up. We'll look at standing up in hand, trotting up in hand and how to ride and lead. While we're handling and leading our horse, assuming we're doing it correctly, we can be fairly sure that no harm comes to him. It's when we're not with him, when he's in the field or in the stable, that we need to know that he is safe and secure. In another programme in this series, Health and Condition, we look in detail at the paddock where the horse will live. Later in this programme, we'll look at what is needed to keep the stabled horse in a healthy and safe environment. To begin with, the most important thing is to understand the horse's mentality. The understanding and sympathy for your horse's feelings is an essential part of good horse management. Understanding his moods will mean you know when to take care. People talk about a horse having a kind or nasty eye, and it is really true that much can be learnt about the horse's character and how he is feeling from his ears, the look in his eye, and his general demeanour. As you get to know your animal, you will begin to recognise as you approach him whether he is in the mood to turn away or if he is feeling calm and pleased to see you. Just as dogs learn the voice of their master, so horses soon recognise and respond to kind words. When approaching the horse in the field, speak as you walk up to him and always take a carrot or handful of nuts with you. Because tacking up and mounting are normally done on the horse's left or near side, it is best to always go to this side when you approach. Go straight to his shoulder and remember that any sudden movement can startle the horse, who might then turn away or even kick out. When near enough, give him a pat on his neck or shoulder. Having unfastened the buckle on the near side cheek piece of the head collar, gently pass the lead rope over his neck. Place the nose band over his muzzle and the head piece over the pole behind his ears. Having fastened the head piece, take the lead rope in your right hand near to the head collar and with your left hand taking the slack, ask the horse to walk on. Walk on. A well-trained yeah. horse will happily walk alongside you. Walk on. No problem, as long as the horse wants to be caught. Some, it seems, will spend any length of time running rings around the poor person trying to catch them. But however angry you might feel, there is absolutely no point in getting cross. When tying up a horse, the best method is to use a head collar and lead rope. The clip on the lead rope should face backwards and be attached to the O-ring on the underside of the head collar. Where you tie up your horse depends on your particular circumstances, but whatever place you choose, safety must come first. If using a ring, you should attach a loop of string to it, strong enough to hold the horse securely, 
but of a type that will break should he panic. If he struggles and can't get free, he could damage or injure his neck. Some man-made string is too strong, so it is advisable to cut a few of the strands to make it weaker. Pass the lead rope through the loop and make fast using some form of recognised quick-release knot. In an emergency, it is vital that the knot can be undone quickly and without fuss. If you are in any doubt as to how the horse might behave when tied up, it is advisable to do so only in the stable or other enclosed space, and ensure that the wall or rail to be used will not give way before the string. Never tie the horse to a hay net. If he pulls back, he will take the hay net with him. Some horses, especially young ones, are inclined to chew the lead rope. This can be an expensive pastime, so alternatively use a rack chain in place of the rope. Tie the chain to the head collar with string. This way, if the string breaks in an emergency, the horse will not be galloping around with a chain dangling from the head collar. Cross tying is a way of securing the horse by means of two lead ropes or chains. It is often used when transporting a single horse in a double trailer that has no partition. It's also a safe way of securing a horse. This is done between two stout posts about two metres apart. Once you are certain that the horse is sufficiently calm while it's tied up, any grooming or other tasks involving contact with the animal may begin. Make sure you tie the horse short enough to retain control and prevent him from nipping you. Always move positively but calmly around the horse. Talking to him will help reassure him that all is well. When picking out feet or inspecting the limbs, it is important to follow the correct procedure. Carelessness or any sudden movement whilst within striking distance of the horse's legs can obviously be very dangerous. In the case of lifting a foreleg, first speak to the horse. Place a hand on his neck and turn to face his tail. Run your hand over his shoulder, down over the elbow and tendons and on touching his fetlock, squeeze the joint while saying up. As the horse lifts his leg, catch hold of his toe. This will result in the horse being less likely to lean on you. When lifting a hind leg, again begin by speaking to the horse. Reassure him all is well. Standing close to his hip while facing his tail, place your hand which is nearest to the horse onto his quarters. Run the hand down the back of the leg until you reach the hock. Move it to the front of the hock and down the inside of the cannon bone. On reaching the fetlock, once again say up. As the horse raises his foot, move the joint slightly backwards, sliding your hand down so it encircles the hoof from the inside. When lifting a leg in order to pick out the foot, follow the same procedure. Having picked up the hoof, you can then easily attend to the foot. If he is reluctant to lift his leg when asked, it helps to lean against his shoulder, so pushing his weight onto the other leg. Take care not to lift the leg too high or too far back, as this may cause the horse to lose his balance. When you want to move around the horse, always go around the front of him. And to make him move over, touch him just behind the girth and tell him to move over. Finally, Remember that constantly talking to the horse might at first feel a bit silly, but it is in fact extremely useful. As long as your voice remains calm and you give praise where it is due, this communication will have a wonderful calming effect on the horse. It is also a crucial part of forming the bond that we aim to have with our animals.
Leading in hand is when a person on the ground leads the horse using either the reins or a lead rope. It is a necessary part of horse care and should therefore be carried out in an accomplished and safe manner. Being much stronger than humans, the horse is quite able to pull free from all but the strongest adult. We must therefore be confident that the horse will walk calmly at our side. He should learn to be led from either side, but until we know our animal, it is best to begin from the left or near side, as he will almost certainly have been handled more from this side. If using a head collar to lead the horse, use one hand to hold the rope a short distance from the head collar. The free end of the rope together with any slack should be held in the other hand. On no account should the rope be wrapped around your hand and never put your fingers through the ring on the head collar. Doing either of these could result in severe injury should the horse panic and attempt to get loose. In and around the stable yard and anywhere other than on a public highway, it is usual for the horse to be led from the near side. If leading on a public highway, the law in Great Britain requires that the horse travels in the same direction as the traffic. You must lead him from the right or off side so that you are between the horse and the traffic. If your horse is in any way unreliable, always wear a riding hat and gloves when handling him from the ground. Safety on the road is essential and further information is available in the highway code. A well-fitting bridle offers more control than a head collar and is therefore useful when dealing with horses likely to spook or misbehave in any way. If leading anywhere that has access to the public highway, when you really need to be in full control of the horse, it is wise to use a bridle. When fitting a bridle, one of the safest ways is to begin with the horse tied up in the stable. Untie the lead rope and put the reins over the horse's neck to stop him escaping. Take off the head collar and put it in a safe place. Put your right hand under his jaw and over onto his nose. Take both cheek pieces and with the thumb of your other hand gently open his mouth and introduce the bit. Good boy. You can then use both hands to slip the headpiece over his ears. Do up the nose band and the throat lash. When using a bridle for leading the horse, the reins should be passed over the head and be held in one hand. This hand should be positioned a short distance from the bit and one finger should divide the reins. The other hand should hold the buckle and to prevent any slack from trailing too close to the horse's legs. To move the horse, stand by the side of his head, facing in the direction in which you intend to move off. Ask the horse to walk on and begin to walk forwards yourself. As we said earlier, the trained horse should readily walk forward by your side. When training a horse, it's useful to have a helper standing a safe distance behind him. The knowledge that somebody is behind him is usually enough to encourage the horse to move forward. With a horse that hangs back, use a whip in your outside hand and gently tap his flank as you ask him to move forward. Don't tug at the head of a reluctant horse and don't stand in front of him staring into his eyes. This will probably make him dig his heels in even more. Whether for a veterinary check or whilst in a showing class, if asked to stand the horse up in hand, stand directly in front of and facing him with the rein held in each hand, close to the bit. Make sure that he is looking confident and alert and that he stands still, showing his confirmation at its best. The vet or show judge will want to see the horse moving freely both at walk and trot. So make sure you choose a non-slip okay, surface such as a very quiet road or drive. Leading from the near side, move away when asked to do so and look ahead, not at the horse. Be sure to allow the horse enough freedom to carry his head naturally. 
Having moved a suitable distance away, turn the horse around and keep yourself on the outside of the turn. Even on a good surface, it's easy for the horse to lose his balance if you turn him too quickly. So do make sure to steady him first before you ask him to turn around. Walk or trot the horse back and pass the onlooker, remembering that if the horse is trotting, you will need to bring him back to walk before turning around again. The veterinary checks a snaffle bridle will provide extra control and will almost certainly be required in the show ring. When we talk about ride and lead, we mean that someone on horseback leads another horse. If a yard is short-staffed or if for any other reason it is inconvenient to ride a horse, ride and lead is a very efficient and labour-saving way of exercising horses. It's also very useful when building the confidence of a very young or inexperienced rider. However, if you do need to ride and lead, remember that there are now two animals to look after and so twice as many things can go wrong. Two horses close together should be temperamentally suited, as well as controllable, if kicking and biting is to be avoided. Horses should be trained to be led from either side. It is wise to use a snaffle bridle and reins for control and safety. The reins can either pass straight to the hand, or the rein furthest away from the rider can be passed through the snaffle ring on the opposite side, the side nearest the rider. This prevents a jointed snaffle turning backwards should the horse pull back or not wish to go forward. Taking the reins of the horse to be led in the hand closest to him, hold the reins midway down and use one finger to divide them. Keep this hand by your knee and as still as possible. For extra protection, the horse might wear knee boots, some form of lower leg protection and overreach boots. The horse being led should not hang back, but nor should he get his head in front of the horse you are riding. If he tries to break away, go with him at first before gradually getting him back under control. Holding on tightly when he first makes a violent movement might just result in your being wrenched out of the saddle. On the public highway, you must stay on the left side of the road. The horse being led must be on your left so that he is protected from the traffic and cannot swing his quarters out into the road. Make sure that you plan your route carefully, taking into account the volume of traffic, visibility, the weather, the type of road and any other hazards likely to cause danger. Loose tack on an unridden horse could be dangerous, so it's important that you know what to do with it to avoid accidents. Run the stirrups up and pass the leathers through the irons and make fast. A surcingle fitted around the saddle secures the saddle flaps. If the stirrup leathers fit loosely on the bars on the saddle, turn up the safety catches to prevent them slipping off. Take great care to ensure that the safety catches are turned back down again before the horse is ridden. If the horse you are leading is wearing a martingale and if you are leading in an emergency or for a very short distance, you can leave the reins over the horse's neck and lead with your hand on one rein, between the bit and the ring on the running martingale. Generally, however, running martingales should be detached from the reins and secured to the neck strap. The horse is then led using the reins, which are taken over the neck. Correct handling of a horse, whether from the ground or while riding another, is vital. It teaches him respect and discipline, which in turn lead to an infinitely more pleasurable relationship between horse and handler. Horses are creatures of habit. In other words, they like things to happen at the same time each day. They are more likely to thrive if they are fed at the same time each day. They like to be ridden or turned out at the same time each day, and they like to be brought in at night at the same time each evening. 
This regularity makes them feel secure, so whenever possible try to keep to a daily routine. Horses are herd animals and are normally happier if they have company. A feeling of security will help them to relax. This will make them easier to manage. Whether they are kept in or outdoors, it is worthwhile to establish a stable routine which will make the task of looking after him easier. The most usual form of stabling is the loose box, so called because once inside the horse is free to move around as much as he likes. It should measure approximately 12 foot square if accommodating a horse and about 12 foot by 10 foot if used by a pony. The stable door is divided into two halves which are secured by strong latches. These open outwards, the top half usually being hooked back and left open. This allows the horse to see out, as well as providing light and ventilation. The doors should be wide enough to let the horse walk in and out without knocking himself. Obviously not all horses are lucky enough to live in the lap of luxury. But as long as the horse has enough room to move about freely in a secure and well-ventilated stable, he won't hold it against you. The floor of the stable should be non-slip, hard wearing and allow no moisture to come through from the soil below. Concrete is ideal but make sure it has a rough finish. The floor should slope slightly to permit drainage. A drain should be positioned either outside the box or in a corner away from the door. Additional light and ventilation should be provided by a window, ideally situated on the same wall as the door. The reinforced glass should be protected by a strong grill. Some horses buck when in the stable and this will ensure no broken glass. At least one securing ring should be positioned about 1.5 metres from the floor. This can be used for tying up the horse as well as for securing the hay net. The higher the ceiling of the stable, the better the ventilation. Dust in the stable will rise with the hot air and should be able to escape through a vent in the roof. This greatly reduces the likelihood of the horse developing allergies. Just as we don't like being in a hot and stuffy room, good ventilation in the stable is essential if the horse is to remain comfortable. Drafts should be excluded from the stable, but not at the expense of a plentiful supply of fresh air. It is better that the horse wears a well-fitting rug than we attempt to keep him warm by blocking out the air. Leaving the top part of the door open at all times should ensure plenty of air whilst not permitting unwanted draught. Any permanent fittings should be sited where they can't cause injury to the horse or prevent him from moving freely around. If using a hay net, make sure to tie it securely and high enough so as not to get caught up in the horse's feet. Straw or belled wood shavings are the most usual way of providing a dry, comfortable bed for the horses. Other forms of bedding include shredded paper, peat and rubber matting. A comfortable bed encourages the horse to lie down and rest and helps to prevent draughts. The soft bedding is kind to his legs and feet and guards against injury when he gets up. It also encourages him to stale. Whatever bedding is used, the stable should be mucked out daily. A wheelbarrow, a variety of forks and a broom will be essential items for the stable yard, as will be a suitably sited muck heap for disposal of the dirty bedding. In this programme we've looked at the need to understand the horse's mentality. We've looked at the importance of the human voice except when performing a dressage test where use of the voice is not permitted. But don't be too shy to talk to your horse. Kind words will soon be recognised and can do much to calm and reassure. When moving towards a horse, always do so positively, but never rush your movements. When handling a horse, always remember that he is much stronger and heavier than you are. Look at his eye and try to judge his mood. This might save you from a kick or a bite. Take care to observe the correct procedures when tying up or leading the horse. 
learn the correct knots and on no account ever wrap the lead rope or reins around your hand. When inspecting limbs or picking out feet, use your voice and run your hand over his body as an indication of your intentions. Learn the sections of the highway code that apply to riders and their animals. When riding or leading, ensure that the two horses are familiar with one another. This should prevent them fighting when walking out together. Never forget the importance of routine. The horse likes to feel secure and following the same routine in and around the stable will help him to relax, thrive and remain happy. All the points mentioned in this programme are covered in more depth in the relevant chapters of the official Manual of the Pony Club, the Manual of Horsemanship, now available in its recently updated 10th edition. The quest for knowledge should always be uppermost in the horseman's mind. We can never know too much. Read as much as possible on the subject, and if in any doubt, never be frightened to ask for advice. As our knowledge increases, so too does our enjoyment of our horses, for we become more confident that we are caring for and training them to the best of our ability. They'll repay our hard work a million times over.